Okay. Well, welcome everybody. I'm Jennifer Wolf, um, the Lucas County Board uh, Provider Training Coordinator, and I'm so excited to have Jenny and Claire here today to um, do this training on sensory stimulation and relaxation techniques. And um, uh, Claire, I hope you'll put a plug in for the toolkit that um, we've been putting together too. That might be oh, a yeah. good follow up yeah. thing too. But yeah. um, I know we've got a lot, they have a lot to cover in a short amount of time. So I'm just going to pass it right over to them to get started. Sounds good. Okay, well, welcome. I'm excited that you're all here. This is wonderful. We're going to do sensory stimulation and relaxation techniques today. This is presented by myself, Jenny Kinney. I'm a work at the Locust County Board of DD, provider support specialist, and part of the senior committee, which is very near and dear to my heart. My partner here working with me, I'll let her introduce herself. My name is Claire Copa, and I am was hired by Memory Lane to work as a consultant um, on a grant. And my title is Coordinator of Education Training and Outreach. Um, and then this past few months, I've been working closely with the senior committee, uh, coming up with different projects um, and presentations such as this one. Um, and one of those other projects is the activity toolbox that will be coming out on a newsletter. But at the end of the presentation, I'll also put the link um, in the chat and this tool is cool because it's a virtual space for all things activities that you could do possibly with your clients um, so make sure you check it out and give us some feedback on that as well i hope you guys enjoy today's presentation thank you i also want to remind you this is a lunch and learn so we truly understand if you want to eat your lunch that's mm -hmm. totally fine with us so we're going to get started. What we're going to talk a little bit about today is introduction to relaxation and sensory stimulation. We'll get into the sensory domains and we'll do a little bit of relaxation techniques. We'll also show you a little bit about um, sensory stim activities and hands-on practice, which you will truly enjoy. So to start, um, we want to give you some basic information on what relaxation and sensory stimulation is, who could use it, and why. Um, often these terms are used interchangeably, um, especially in the world of activities, but really they're different uh, techniques and um, they can be used differently, although there is overlap in them and you'll understand shortly. So what exactly is relaxation? In simple terms, it's um, a state of low tension in the mind and body. When we're in a state of tension, um, there's physical stiffness in our body. We can even experience pain, um, intense emotional reactions or feelings of anxiety, where um, when you're physically relaxed, you're working to undo that tension and progressively relax those muscles and different muscle groups. And then again, psychologically, so what's going on in our head, um, relaxation occurs in the mind um, when we're relatively free of that stress and distraction or um, intense uh, stimulation we might be experiencing. Um, so we all have stress in our lives and it come eaves and flows, right? Um, but we can use relaxation techniques to help cope with that stress. And some of the clients you might be helping or family members, anybody, anybody can use relaxation techniques. Um, they can help specifically address that tension that is, might be occurring. Um, some people struggle with being able to relax. Um, and that's why these specific techniques that can be taught could be helpful where some of us are able to naturally relax our tension relatively easily and have just learned through, over time and experiences. Um, but some of those significant stressors, um, such as, you know, clinical depression and anxiety, being unemployed, um, maybe having diet issues or health issues, those are significant life stressors that don't really go up and down. It's kind of more of a constant. Um, so again, those would be times when using specific relaxation techniques might be helpful. Whereas 
whereas uh, sensory stimulation really focuses on the input and the sensation you receive from one of your five senses. So vision, hearing, touch, taste, and smell. Um, and sensory stimulation is a technique, a general technique that is used to activate those senses and send those signals to your brain that your senses are being stimulated. Um, we have senses because it helps us interact with our world, right? If one of those senses aren't there, you have a different experience. So again, working with people with disabilities, older adults with memory loss, both those populations can benefit from sens sensory stimulation because their senses might be, they might be born with um, not having all their senses activated as they should, or as you age, those senses become, become, become less sensitive. So um, using sensory stimulation can help with that. But again, there's overlap between both of these um, types of techniques. Um, the benefits on why we would be practicing this, besides obviously it feels good to be relaxed. Um, uh, there's many studies that have been done with these different techniques. So the, the, the benefits I'm going to describe here um, are all based in research and have been um, years of research finding that these are benefits with different populations. Um, first and foremost, overall, we have found that um, it can improve well-being. It can reduce anxiety and depression. It can help maintain your quality of life. Um, it stimulates brain activity. Again, provides that comfort um, during stress or even uh, experience a panic attack. If you have clients that experience panic attacks, teaching them a simple relaxation technique or sensory stimulation technique can help um, reduce that panic attack or cope after the panic attack. Um, increase concentration on alertness. Um, we were actually just talking about this before the presentation that some children struggle with sensory processing um, and that when they're trying to learn in school, it can help to stimulate their senses so that they can stay focused on a specific task. Um, that's also apparent with those with autism, ADHD, and just general sensory processing disorders. Um, it also facilitates that connection between positive memories and um, can also produce positive emotions. And lastly, reinforce those relationships with loved ones and connections with the community because these techniques can be done with others. Um, and typically, if you're working with an older adult with memory loss, someone's going to be there with them trying these activities or techniques, I should say. So again, it helps with those relationships. Um, and lastly, the known evidence-based health benefits is that it physically can slow your heart rate down and breathing rate. That's why it works for panic attacks, um, lowering your blood pressure, improving your digestion. Um, when you're in a state of stress, I'm sure we all can relate, your digestion can become um, messed up um, or even eating can be difficult to do or you eat too much in times of stress. So these techniques can help with eating habits and digestion. Um, it reduces the activity of stress hormones, increases blood flow to the major muscle groups that then reduces tension. Um, likewise, you can see where this would help with people that experience chronic pain in their muscles. Um, and lastly, it can help improve sleep quality and reduce anger and frustration. So as I'm sure you can guess, who can use relaxation techniques? Anyone. We all need sensory stimulation to thrive and interact with the world. Um, with that being said, we, as uh, working at Lucas County Board of DD, um, there's sp specific techniques um, that might be helpful for your population that you're working with. Um, but between children, aging adults, those with DD, mental illness, and cognitive disorders, um, all these techniques have been researched with these populations and have been proven to be beneficial. Next, we'll move on to sensory domains. Take it away, Jenny. All right, thank you. So we'll move into sensory domains and we'll take a look at what those are gonna be. As you can see, there are five, we all know our five senses. We have vision, taste, smell, touch, hearing. We use our senses to activate, it's an activation. 
And so we're gonna use it to communicate to the brain. And we'll start with vision. Scientifically, when the light passes through your cornea, um, it reaches your lens and the focus is on the retina. Basically, it just converts into a, the nerve signal and carries to your optic nerve to the brain to create that picture of what you are looking at, that object. But when we do sensory, we have to do um, considerations. Decrease in sight can cause confusion, disorientation, the inability to interpret the images correctly. We often have a depth perception with someone with dementia. Well, sometimes we can't always vision what's there. So some images may prompt bad memories instead of good memories. So we have to keep that in mind. Next, we'll move on to taste. I found this one interesting because Claire shared this. I did not realize we have approximately 10,000 taste buds. So we have 10,000 taste buds that will send signals to your brain, identifying sweet, salty, sour, bitter, savory flavors. You know, you all have taste. You got your favorite taste of food. But we have to consider that taste is also affected by what our smell ability is. The temperature, the texture. So the loss of smell can decrease the loss of taste and vice versa. I know someone that had an injury and they have a decrease in taste, but it has also affected their smell. So it goes, it goes hand in hand. And we'll keep moving on to the smell since it walked right into it. When specialized cells high on your nose send signals to your brain, it'll identify what the scent is. There are olfactory sensory neurons on the roof of your mouth, which ties into your taste. But we have to considerations going on. Again, it's common that um, in Alzheimer's, what they have found is the first sense to go away or decrease is usually smell. So with that decrease in, it can have the um, decrease in the taste. Again, they kind of go hand in hand. Next, we'll go on to touch. Okay, I like touch. So one thing about touch is the nerve endings and our skin, our body, um, they transmit the signals to our brain. It interprets them as a pain, a pressure, a vibration, temperature, body position, all the above. One thing about touch we have to consider is the skin when someone's getting older can be thin, okay? May cause easy tearing of the skin and then we've got open wounds, bruising as easily. We also have to remember we need to have permission before we touch and we don't touch from behind. We need to turn around, face them, they can see you, ask permission before touching. But touching is very vital. It's a very important part of connecting with each other. We move into hearing. So hearing, when a sound vibration crosses your eardrum to your inner ear, changes in the nerve signals and are transmitted to your brain by your auditory nerve. Notice everything's communication to your brain. Okay, that's how it all works. So some considerations, the decrease in hearing, unable to process the sound correctly, could increase confusion and agitation. We need to think about decreasing any background noise. If you're talking to someone and there's TV blaring in the background and they can't hear you, or there's confusion, they might be turning in, we need to think about those in our environment. For one thing I would say with hearing is what I found with people that are losing their hearing, they try to get brighter lights. Or if they're losing their eyesight, they might turn the volume up on things. So we're gonna move into relaxation techniques and sensory stim activities. So let's take a look at some of our activities that we can offer. You can see we have broken down like, um, excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, Alzheimer's, DD, older adults. The ideas are endless, they're out there, Pinterest, YouTube, but this is just a snapshot example. Somebody with Alzheimer's, they might used to play an instrument or they used to sing a lot, um, preparing or cooking food. They like to have manicure, so maybe hand massages might walk in there. With the DD population, you know, when it weighted blankets, fidget toys, they're all great, but guess what? Weighted blankets can go across the Alzheimer's as well. Same with our older adults, okay? Light therapy, gardening, essential oils, listening to different types of music. What did they listen to growing up? Are they in the big band air, 
the 60s, the 50s, you know, we have to think about what was their choice of music? What did they like? And then we bring that back to them. Again, endless opportunities, endless. We just want to yeah, share and that so, a little bit. And with these activities, you know, it's, we've all probably thought about these activities and know these activities and might've done these, but it's how you use them. So for example, with an older adult gardening, I used to live, work in a memory care facility. We always had the option for gardening, but when I wanted to use it for stem, sensory stimulation, that was a specific activity where I knew there were certain patients I had or residents, I should say, that needed some form of physical sensory stimulation at that time. So I took them out to garden rather than a planned activity that everybody's gonna do. So again, it's how you use these activities at the times of need. So if there's a need for sensory stimulation or even relaxation, um, you, you would use this activity specifically for that need rather than just general, right? We walk with clients all the time, um, that's great. But then there also can be a time where we're also using it for sensory stimulation. Absolutely, Claire. Thank you. So then let's move on to some specific relaxation techniques. And again, relaxation techniques do involve your senses, um, but there's specific techniques that um, are categorized for relaxation versus sensory stimulation. First and foremost, aromatherapy. Um, and this approach to relaxation involves using essential oils or other natural fragrance, fragrances to reduce stress and induce a sense of calmness. Um, research has shown that aromatherapy can be effective relaxation strategy with some uh, scientifically proven um, that essential oils for reducing stress include um, sage, uh, lavender, and other senses or, or uh, essential oil smells. Um, um, that are out there. So aromatherapy is great. Um, there's many different ways you can use it. You could put it on a cloth. It could be a room spray. You could have a diffuser. Um, the important thing to remember is that essential oils for consumption hasn't been well researched and there is been some areas of research where it could be harmful. So again, essential oils are for the environment. Um, and even putting it on skin could be dangerous and make sure you clear it with a, a doctor or um, a caregiver to know that that's okay to put it on their skin. Um, I use it in a diffuser or essential oil that's mixed in a, a lotion so I know it's safe. Um, there's many places you can buy aromatherapy. Um, you don't have to buy the most expensive kind possible. Um, I've even seen it at the dollar store, little bottles of essential oils. You could just use a candle and you could even make your own. Um, I used to have work with a client who was uh, um, struggled with substance abuse and he loved the smell of fresh cut grass and he found that that was calming to him. So during the summer, he used to have a baggie filled with fresh cut grass and he would carry it around. And when he felt uh, triggered or stressed, he would smell it. So again, an example of how aromatherapy can look very different depending on how you implement it. Breathing. Um, every relaxation technique you use um, it should start with a breathing exercise. It helps you focus in on what you're doing, slows your heart rate and breathing um, down. Um, and it, taking a deep breath is requires you to use your full lung capacity. They say we rarely use 100% of our lung capacity unless we're under significant, doing a significant strenuous activity. So when we purposely take in a deep um, breath and use 100% of our lung capacity, um, we're obviously getting more oxygen in our blood than we typically do just sitting here and breathing. And that's why it's helpful. Um, so it helps um, someone reduce the stress ho hormones levels and calms the strong responses to stress in that moment. There's many different breathing techniques. We'll practice a couple basic ones when we do a hands-on activity at the end. Physical activity, exercise, such as yoga, jogging, um, are all great techniques as well um, for inducing relax the relaxation response. Massage, 
Um, so this can be self-massage. Um, I have also worked at Arrowhead Behavioral Health and we used to do uh, self-hand massages. So we would teach them how to um, massage their palm, then each of their fingertips, since it's not always um, easily, uh, and not everybody's capable of affording a $100 massage, right? Or might have not have a partner or support system that's willing to give a massage, right? Or might not have that person. So there's many ways that massage can be helpful, but then being able to do it for yourself is also help, uh, a good technique to teach your clients so that they also can do it on their own when someone else might not be there. Um, another relaxation technique is meditation. Um, this involves a quiet, comfortable space where you're able to focus and calm your mind and body. Um, specifically, mindfulness meditation has been proven to help with anxiety symptoms. Um, even uh, grounding techniques can be a form of meditation where, for example, um, walking outside with bare feet, going from a really cold environment to a really warm environment, taking a hot shower, counting four blue things you see in a room or uh, saying five things you hear or counting to 10 and backwards from 10. Those are all grounding techniques that also can be a form of meditation. Meditation doesn't always have to be that stereotypical where your legs are crossed, you're sitting on the ground and you have your fingers up, right? Uh, that's the very stereotypical picture people think of a meditation. And that's why often people don't wanna try it. They automatically assume it won't work for them. So um, meditation, there's a lot of great videos on that on YouTube as well. Um, and I'm gonna skip over the next two to go straight into guided imagery, which is also a form of meditation, but it's where someone guides you either through a script or in a video where they're showing you something or telling you what to think about, where they guide what you think about while you're meditating. So it takes you to a place where it's a, a relaxing, relaxing um, scenery, such as the beach or walking through a metro park, anything like that. Um, Music, obviously, it, it uh, reduces tension and relaxation um, and can even soothe sadness, anxiety. Um, making sure the music works for your client is important. What work, might work for you might not work for someone else. And then lastly, I want to talk about progressive mu muscle relaxation. That's what we're going to be trying today. And this involves tensing and relaxing um, specific muscle groups in your body over a certain amount of time to induce full body relaxation. Um, I like to best explain it that, you know, after you do a strenuous activity, like a workout or a really long hike, whatever that might be, typically your response to your body is it might feel like jello or super relaxed that you might not feel like you have as much strength. And often after um, at least an hour after strenuous activity, people even feel sleepy and tired and restful. So that's an example of what actually doing a progressive muscle relaxation technique correctly can have those same effects without doing a strenuous activity or workout. And one thing too, with um, working in the past with some of my individuals, when people see yoga, they get a little nervous. There's mm -hmm. chair yoga. It's like with progressive relaxation, you don't always have to get on the floor. You can do it in a chair. So we do adapt a lot of these activities to fit our client needs. Mm -hmm. And I guess I should mention in that activity toolbox I'm going to share, um, there's a whole tab and section on relaxation techniques. And I have some of those adapted relaxation techniques in there that are appropriate for any age group um, that might need a more adapted version. But great point. So implementation success. So um, when you try these techniques with yourself, especially, you should try it with yourself first. Um, first time might not be successful. Um, I, I, when I practice this and to do group therapy and I do a relaxation group, I always warn my clients. I'm like, you might not like this at first. You might say it didn't relax you. In fact, it might've irritated you, right? Listening to this calming voice in a video. It doesn't always work right away. 
Um, relaxation technique and sensory stimulation techniques take practice for them to work, for your body to understand to, um, how to respond to these techniques. Secondly, you should individualize. Um, focus on your clients' preferences for music tastes, visual images. Um, you know, if you're working with a client that never goes to the park and it being in nature might be scary to them, just as a random example, you probably don't want to take them through a guided imagery relaxation technique where we're talking about being in a park, right? That wouldn't be very relaxing to them. Rather, you might want to choose being at the beach. Maybe that's more appropriate. So making sure you know your client well or whoever it's for, um, their interests, needs, and preferences before you try these techniques. Maybe um, physical activity is kind of intimidating, as Jenny was saying, like yoga, they're already turned off the, uh, by that idea. So maybe try aromatherapy first, because that might be something new that they haven't heard of, and they might be more uh, tempted to really give it a good go rather than jumping right into yoga. Secondly, or thirdly, I should say, is time and the selection of the activity. Make sure you have enough time. These activities have to be planned. You have to have the supplies ready, and it has to be an appropriate time for the person who's doing it. Don't do it at a time when they're going to be rushed to lunch right afterwards, or they have an appointment they have to go to. Make sure it's an appropriate time that works for their schedule. Um, try to offer activities that um, involve multiple senses. Don't just focus on one. Um, but again, make sure the activity you're choosing is appropriate for the person and it should induce a sense of safety, comfort, joy. Um, and if it doesn't, think on your feet and adapt, switch it up. Um, again, for aromatherapy, there's many different smells. Um, when I offer it to clients, I have 10 different options because I know what I like or what another client like, another person might not like. So if they don't like it and they're not liking the experience, switch it up right away, remove that aromatherapy and try a new type. Um, being able to adapt quickly is important for the success of these activities. Because the last thing you wanna do is induce more stress or anxiety because what they're doing isn't working. I always say have an extra bag of tricks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one, one that I always like to mention, I worked when I worked in a memory unit, the women were not comfortable with hand massages and forearms. But if you started out with, let's do a manicure, let's paint our nails, and then just let, let's put some lotion on. Like Claire said, it might not work right away, but it takes time to build up. So I just want to give another example of a success that, you know, you go in steps to make that mm -hmm. successful for them. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Um, so I want to talk about, again, some steps to implementation. And there's one part that I did, I realized I didn't add to this slide, which is ad addressing environmental barriers. So you want to try to make sure this activity can be as successful as possible by um, controlling the environment. So making sure it is um, a safe place, it's a calm space, there's not someone going in and out, um, something maybe where you could dim the lights if that works for your clients or turn up the lights. Um, Some place where you can control noise, the temperature. Try to think about all those things, um, environmental factors um, that could then be a barrier for the technique from working. If you could address those and control those as much as possible, more likely the technique will be successful. So during implementation, first and foremost, make sure you're observing, look at their facial expressions, their body language, do you see them physically relaxing? If you're noticing more stress or uh, maybe not even um, engaged in the activity, that might be a time to adapt, switch things up. Listen to their voice. Are they uncomfortable? Um, are they trying to vocalize this stress? So try to listen to your clients during these times. Be careful, as we've said before, you don't want to trigger an unpleasant memory. So you want to be individualizing the activities and make sure these work for your clients specifically. I mean, just talking about touch, that could be a very sensitive um, experience for someone who maybe has gone through physical abuse or noticeably always says, you know, I don't like hugs. I don't want to shake your hands. You probably shouldn't jump into massage, right? Seems like a no brainer, but um, Often we forget because we just want to try this new activity. You might enjoy it, but your client might not. 
Um, adapt, always be prepared with an alternative activity or a way to adapt the current activity you're doing. Or if you need to discontinue, that's okay. So making your client feel um, safe that, yeah, this is a new relaxation technique. It might feel a little weird at first. You might be confused to why we're doing it. But if any time you don't feel comfortable, we can stop. And, and that provides that safe environment with you and the person you're working with to be more willing to try it again in the future because you gave them that out. Um, so always make sure they know that you don't have to continue. It's not something forced. Lastly, assess. Are there positive emotions or memories being expressed or shared specifically afterwards? Um, always processing after doing these types of activities can be important so they understand why they did it and what came of it so that they might want to do it again. Yeah, I remember when I tried aromatherapy, I felt really relaxed afterwards or made me feel really good or that smell made me think of my childhood summer, whatever it might be. If they're saying those things, it's helping remind them that, wow, that worked and I might want to do that again. Always take into account um, your individual's needs, strengths, and desires. Always remember that though. Okay, well, I'd like to introduce this video, but I have a couple things. It's about music. Music can bring alive memories and joy to a person. But there's this quote by Dr. Jeff Anderson, who's a PhD MD. People with dementia are confronted by a world that is unfamiliar to them which causes disorientation and anxiety. Music will tap into the thalamus network of the brain that is still relatively functioning. What's interesting about that is we're gonna watch this video. She's a former professional ballerina and her name is Marta Santa Gonzalez. She danced and performed in many ballets, including the Swan Lake. She lived in Cuba, danced in New York and taught in Madrid. She was diagnosed with dementia, believed to be Alzheimer's. This video takes place in a nursing facility where she dreamed actually of doing ballet with the elderly. Unfortunately, she passed away in 2019. So let's watch this video showing the benefits of music for Marta as her mind travels to another time in her life where she will dance to her old routine. I want you to watch her graceful arms, hands, and head movement and look for her beautiful expressions of what the music can do for her as part of a sensory stimulation activity. All right, I'm gonna push play. Uh, Jenny, please let me know if, if the sound's off or okay. doesn't, you can't hear. I had to press it right on the arrow in the okay. picture the other day. I cannot hear the sound. Can you hear now? It started. Could you hear it? Yes. Okay. If you can turn it up a little bit. I'm not hearing it. There we go.
Okay, we can probably stop right there because it goes into Spanish, I think. Um, please come off mute or put something in chat if you have any comments on that before we go into the hands-on practice. As you can see, the memories that just evolved. Yeah, it gave me goosebumps too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, what, what's astonishing is without that music, she probably didn't remember that routine, but it's that routine and that music. And once it starts, it happens. It is a great recall. Yes, muscle memory was still intact. Absolutely, Amy, absolutely. My thing is, did you watch the grace, her movement, her smile, her expression when she was on the dance? If you take all of that, and then I want you to step back for just a minute and think about when a song comes on from your high school years, or do you remember that dance you did and how you did it? And the, and the expression and the feeling of joy that comes about. That is just a little itty bitty taste of what music can do for a sensory stim. And I always say there's a byproduct on any sensory stimulation activity. You know, you not only are you listening and hearing, you know, all of a sudden there she is physically moving. She's moving and going. You know, it's not just one activity that happens. So let, thank you for letting me share that. That that brought tears to my eyes the first time I saw that one. Well, first off, it's a very emotional scene. Um, <laughs> so, but yeah, I've seen that video before and I was like, oh, this is perfect for this topic. And again, I think it speaks to knowing who you're working with and you're trying to do these activities with. So she might not have been able to vocalize that, right? And so when we're assessing our clients or you're working with someone, talking to family members, trying to gather that information, what music did they like to do? What, what activities did they like to do in their childhood, especially with memory loss? Um, they're not going to probably be able to vocalize that, but those memories are still intact, those deep in their brain. So if you can get that information and then try it with your clients, you might be surprised um, what they can do. Maybe they can't uh, write their name, but you give them a paintbrush because they used to be an amazing painter and suddenly they can paint if you use an adapted paintbrush. So all those techniques um, all come from really knowing who you're working with and um, doing something that works for them um, that they previously might have enjoyed. Absolutely. And I like how you mentioned, Claire, it's not the music we like. Um, so sometimes you might have a 20 year old or a 30 year old yeah. working with someone that's 70 or 80. And, and I remember trying to explain that in my memory care. I'm like, um, this is a big band era group. We need yeah. to look at that. <laughs> now we're moving into work. the Viet right. Right. Now we're moving to Vietnam War. Well, let's right. listen to the Rat Pack. Let's listen to the, the Beatles. Yeah. You know? Right. Um, and I'll tell you what, that made me learn how to really love the uh, big band era. <laughs> Take it away. All right. So um, if you can, I want you guys to pause what you're doing to just let's relax for 10 minutes. Um, I'm going to do what I do in a group at Arrowhead Behavioral Health. Um, so I know it works with adults um, and it's good to practice. I want to mention this relaxation techniques are best practiced. Um, when you're not in a time of significant stress. So you know you can really focus on the activity and learn what it does rather than in a time when you really need it. So um, that's why with clients or yourself, practicing in a time of not needing it, it could be beneficial so that when they are having a panic attack or showing high anxiety um, or they're triggered by their environment and say, you know what, let's go back to that deep breathing. Remember when we practiced that? Let's do that now, right? So practicing at a time of not need is important. And that's what we're going to do today. Now, some of you might be significantly distressed, so this could help as well. But I want to try progressive muscle relaxation. Um, if you tried it before, great. If not, um, give it a go. Uh, try to most of you are at work or um, in a space where maybe it's not the perfect environment. Uh, so I'm going to challenge you to try to ignore your environment. Obviously, you're not probably in a comfy bed or a comfy chair in a quiet space and in a dark room, right? It's not ideal. So ignore those barriers for right now. Um, this video will talk to you about breathing and then we'll walk you through progressive muscle relaxation technique. So we just need to listen to what they're saying. But um, I always tell 
uh, clients off the bat to just first off try to get themselves in a comfortable position in their chair um, to start and then listen to what they're saying. But to give you as a, uh, an idea of what's going to happen, they're going to talk about certain body part muscles and ask you to tense it and then release. Um, it goes pretty quickly. Something else you can add to this technique with clients is to have aromatherapy or lotion or candles burning. Um, it can also add that sensory stimulation piece um, to doing progressive muscle relaxation at the same time. Again, I will push play. Please tell me if you can't hear it. I will turn up my volume. Does anybody have questions before we start? All right, please give it a go to the best of your ability. Try to focus for 10 minutes and then we'll talk afterwards and let me know what you thought. Hello, and welcome to this guided progressive muscle relaxation. Find a comfortable position sitting or lying down. Take a few moments to iron out the kinks and get comfortable while I introduce you to what we will be doing today. Progressive muscle relaxation or PMR is an exercise to relax your mind and body by progressively tensing and relaxing muscles. As we move through, follow my instructions, tensing the muscle as much as you can. But if you experience any pain or discomfort, and listen to your body. You might choose to skip that muscle group or to only gently tense it. Let's prepare by taking a few deep breaths. Close your eyes or gently fix your gaze ahead of you. Breathe in through your nose, drawing the air deep into your belly, letting the rib cage expand. Hold your breath just for a moment and exhale fully through your mouth. As we move through the exercise, ensure you keep breathing. Inhale as you tense and exhale as you relax. And as we are going through this exercise, your mind might start to wander. That's okay. Just notice it and non-judgmentally bring your mind back to the muscle group we are focusing on. Let's get started. Bring your attention to your feet. Inhale and curl your toes under, squeezing the muscles. Feel the tension build in your feet. And exhale and release. Visualize the tension flowing out. You might even like to say in your head or out loud, relax. Let your feet feel heavy and relax fully into a comfortable position. Next, bring your attention to your calves and thighs. As you inhale, tense these muscles tightly. Hold the tension. and exhale as you release. Feel the weight and the warmth in your legs. Let them relax fully. Next is your buttocks. Tense these muscles again as you inhale, trying your best to isolate them. Continue to hold the tension for a few more moments and release with your exhale, saying to yourself, relax. Take a few moments to notice the sensations in your legs and notice if there are any areas of tension that you need to tense and relax again before we continue to move up the body. When you are ready, 
bring your attention to your abdomen. Inhale and tense your muscles like something is about to hit you in the stomach. Hold the tension. And relax. Exhale all of the tension in this area and let the muscles relax. Feel the tension flow out fully. Next is your upper back. When you are ready, inhale and pull your shoulder blades together. Arch your back and hold it. Exhale and release. Bring your attention to the shoulders. Inhale and squeeze the shoulders up to your ears. Hold the tension and feel it building. And release. Feel your shoulders drop back down. Feel the weight and the warmth. Let's continue down the arms, focusing on the biceps and forearms. Inhale and tense the whole arm while trying to leave the hands relaxed. Hold the tension in the biceps and forearms for a few more moments. Exhale and release. and bring your attention to your hands. Inhale and squeeze them into fists. Imagine you are trying to squeeze the juice out of a lemon. Hold and release, saying to yourself, relax. Notice the heaviness in your arms and let them rest. Finally, bring your attention to your face. As you inhale, tense the muscles in your face. You can wiggle your nose, purse your lips, or move your mouth into a wide smile. You can raise your eyebrows or frown. Whatever feels right to you, don't forget to breathe. Exhale and release. Let your face fall into a neutral expression. Feel the tingling and the warmth. Once more, scan over your body and notice if there are any remaining areas of tension that you need to tense and release again. Listen to your body and give it what it needs to relax. Now just sit or lie still for a few more moments. Let your body feel heavy like it could sink through the floor. Breathe in slowly, letting your rib cage expand and exhale fully. When you are ready, gently blink your eyes open. Wiggle your fingers and your toes 
and let those little movements create ripples through your body. You might rotate your wrists and ankles, roll your neck or take a stretch. Listen to your body and respond. All right, so as you guys come out of that state of trance, hopefully, I know you guys are at work. Um, just as a reminder, there's so many videos out there. This person had more of a British English accent. There's ones with different voices. You could just use a script, maybe sitting in a circle with a group of your clients and then say, okay, we're gonna start with their feet. We're gonna tense our feet and then our calves and our thighs. <laughs> you walk through it with them. So there's many different options. Um, it doesn't have to be exactly like this. There's videos that are 30 minutes to two hours. Um, so whatever, again, works for the individual you're trying to help. It got me getting ready for bed. <laughs> I'm yeah. Ready, right? <laughs> I'm ready for a big old Good, bed. good. <laughs> you got and my Marcia. body. <laughs> My body's telling me to take a nap now. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. It's also lunch. And I was like, you probably ate and relaxed. And <laughs> Maybe work's not going to happen now. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, one thing I want to say with the relaxation, and I, I think Claire mentioned it, so I'll just piggyback off of it. Um, know your individuals and know what they can do. Um, sometimes my elderly I don't want to say frail, but they had arthritic hands and stuff. No way they couldn't do the whole thing, but then that's where the guided imagery and she offered so many other opportunities. This one is great for, definitely for us. But I gotta be careful, I am at work, but um, yeah, I just like to piggyback off that. Remember, know your individuals, what their needs are and what they can physically and mentally handle. But relaxation is for everybody. Um, so I'll jump into the resources. Here we go. Let's end on a happy note. Um, that's why I have my friend, the giraffe, with me. So we will send this PowerPoint out to you all. We do have some references here that we got this information from. Again, there's a lot of information on YouTube, Pinterest. That's one of my favorite to get ideas for sensory programming. We also have a list that we will send out to you as well. Um, I don't know, Claire, do you have it available? or? Am I at a share where I can pull it up real quick? Yeah, why don't you go ahead and share? Okay. Oh, I have to wait. Let me pull it up. So Jennifer, do I have access? And while she's, I'm also okay. going to get the activity toolbox. Perfect. There we go. Okay, great. So we'll just send this out to you. <laughs> Excuse me. My goodness. It's called Engaging the Senses. Again, these are just very, very tip of the iceberg type of thing. We'll give you some ideas. Um, for all five areas of the senses, one thing that we didn't mention, you know, even a sound machine, we talked a lot about a uh, variety of music, but, you know, you have some listening to waves or waterfalls, just some nice things. I like how you can get on um, the TV and watch a fire in a fireplace, just some wonderful things that are mm -hmm. so available to all of us. On that list, we also have some links that you can go into. 75, Engaging Senior Sensory Activities for Adults with Disabilities. Hopefully these links will just help you get started on what can be done. And then we added just a very simple, kind of what's gonna be in the activity tools, but we thought we'd just throw this one on for you to get started. It's a touch and smell activity, non-essential, or non-essential, non-sewing essential oil heating pad. We use this in one of our Aging Gracefully newsletters. So if you can see, I'll go back up, I'll try not to get you dizzy. You have touch, you have smell, there's two of the senses. Relaxation, there's your essential oil, heat. But be careful, again, you gotta be careful with some of these because you don't wanna burn somebody um, depending on their skin. So it's again, just please be aware of the individuals you work with. We just, I'm very passionate about this area. I know Claire is very passionate about this. We are here to help you reach out to us. We're happy to be of an assistance. Um, I will take off my chair in case you want to pop up something with the, the um, activity tool. I didn't know if you're doing that or putting it in the link. 
Um, I put the link in so you guys can copy and paste that. I know it's also going out in the newsletter um, for the sake of time. I'll, I'll leave it at that. If anybody has comments, questions, or can think off the back of anybody that they could try this with soon, um, we're happy to hear. Um, and thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you for coming. We appreciate it. You guys have a eventful but relaxing afternoon. Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you. On May 24th and 26th. Dolores is asking about. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Dee, we will be sending out certificates for this one and for the one on the 24th. Have a good weekend, everybody. Yeah. Oh, that's right. It's a three-day. Happy Memorial mm -hmm. Day.